All right, I want to revisit a notion that we very briefly talked about the last class period. And, oh, well, that'll work. Oh, here we go. It's this idea that if you're given a curve, okay, f of x, then geometrically, it's very well defined to talk about wanting an area function. It might be hard to figure out, but the notion is super easy to talk about, right? I, if So I, I fix my starting point, little a, and I want my area as a function of x. When I slide my x value around, it'll tell me the area between f and the x-axis and between a and little x. So it's this little shaded region here. And what I had mentioned in last class is if you look at the derivative of this area function, so this is the limit as h goes to 0 of a of x plus h minus a of x all over h, what you're going to get is the original f of x function. And again, for a picture of that, right, you should imagine being very, very close to x. And so now a... I'm going to zoom back out. So this line here is x plus h. And so a of x plus h is the area of not just all this region here, but it goes all the way up to the second line. Okay. So that's a of x plus h. But when I take away a of x, that takes away all the area up to the first line. And so all that I'm left with is just this little sliver here this little sliver, and that little sliver is basically a rectangle, right? We can see here that that top piece is a little off, and if you all really wanted to get into the technicalities of the proof, so, so this point right here, this height is f of x, and the little missing piece, okay, well, the width of that little missing piece is h, right? Because I'm going from x to x plus h. That's my horizontal travel. And the height, because f is continuous, so this little, little height here, it also turns out is proportional to h. And if you don't believe me, think of a tangent line coming down. And that can sort of sweep out a little triangle. And... Because it's a line, we know that the change in y over change in x is constant. They're related. And so this little height is proportional to h. Maybe it's some constant times h. Maybe it's the slope times h. And so the little bit of error, it turns out, it's, it's proportional to some constant times h squared. And so I could write this sliver of area here, I could write this sliver of area, aka, I'll tell you what, let's just, let's do this whole thing. The sliver of area, which is my numerator, is exactly the rectangle f of x times h, but I overshot. I, I'm actually off by this much, right? So, so let me explain this again. So f of x is this whole height here, boom f of x times h would be the entire rectangle, including, including this overshoot. So, well, I don't actually have that. What I just have is the part below the graph, so it's my whole rectangle minus the error. And then I divide by h, and I want the limit as h goes to 0. And notice what happens, right? This h kills that one, it kills that power. And as h goes to 0, you're left with just f of x. But geometrically, we didn't have to go into all this detail. You can just imagine as my x plus h slides closer and closer to x, this becomes a better and better approximation. And yeah, the derivative of my area should be f of x. So that's really useful. And it's part of what's known as a differential equation. And there are entire courses dedicated to differential equations. Uh, don't let that vocabulary scare you, even though we don't know what it means. Um, it won't matter for the sake of what I'm about to talk about. The point is, we now know, we know, that whatever this mystery area function is, its derivative must be f of x. And I claim we know something else. Let's look back at this picture and imagine sliding x all the way over, 
all the way over it until we get to A. So I drew it with a little bit, but in fact, keep on sliding it after that. Slide over even more. The area is going to go away, right? If, if I plug in x equals a, so I slide this x all the way over to be a, then my area is zero. If there is no width, there is no area. Area requires two dimensions, and so I just slide that x all the way over, area is gone. All right, so this is the game we play. Someone has given us a function f of x, and we want to find an area function. And what we know about this mystery area function, what we know is that one, its derivative, is the original curve, and two, an initial condition, which is if I plug in a, I get zero. And let's do an example to play this game. Suppose I want zero to x of sine t dt. And this might seem a little silly for me to write sine t. Um, we need to get used to the idea that the variable that I integrate is often not the variable in the limit. Um, but regardless, picture the exact same picture that I've been drawing. I have a sine function, and wherever x is, I want this area in here. So nothing new, just a little bit different notation. All right. This is my mystery function, a of x. Well, so that means, that means we need a prime to equal my function on the inside. Now I can write sine x because these inputs have to match. Okay, so what is a function whose derivative is sine x? Let's see. How about, how about negative cosine x? We can check. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so if I put a negative one in front, I get positive sine x. Great. But we also need a of 0. 0 is that lower bound. Right? We need a of 0 to equal 0. And right now, if I plug in 0, I'm going to get cosine of 0, which is 1, but negative cosine of 0 would be negative 1. So what I could do is I could say, well, in general, a of x, if I want a function, I want a function whose derivative is sine x. The minus cosine x gives me what I want, but in fact, I could add any constant. And that constant is what lets us satisfy this condition. So if I plug in a of 0 is minus cosine of 0, which is negative 1, plus c. But on the other hand, that has to equal 0. I put that over here. And this tells me c is equal to 1. So, so from these two constraints, conditions, whatever you want to call them, from the idea that we knew the derivative and we knew an initial condition, we can actually conclude that a of x is minus cosine of x plus 1. And the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we're going to get to, is going to speed this up even more, and it's going to say, you know what? Don't worry about this whole C business. And instead, the moment you have a function whose derivative is the thing inside the integrand, then you can just jump straight to, right, so let's, uh, suppose I just use b of x is minus cosine x. Then once I have a function whose derivative is sine x, then my area function I can write as this thing, so my particular example, minus my particular example at 0. Let's see what that says. So this is b of x, so that's minus cosine x, minus. And now if I plug in 0, I have minus cosine 0. But cosine of 0 is 1, so negative that is negative 1. And now I have a negative negative. I get minus cosine of x plus 1. So I got the same answer. And I didn't have to go through this whole C business. I just had to find an antiderivative. Any old antiderivative will work. Antiderv. And then you have your upper endpoint minus your lower endpoint. And that's where we're going to get with the fundamental reactions. All right, let me show you graphically a picture of this relationship, just to show you that we have the right answer. So here we go. All right, my red curve is sine of x, just like before, or sine of t. And my green curve, you know, I want to change this, just to make it a little bit nicer. We'll go up to 5. That works. Okay. 
my, my green curve is my area function. And I'm just shading in black to show you how far we've swept out. So for example, by the time that I get to pi, my green curve looks like it's two. And we'll check that in a moment. But um, so in other words, that whole shaded black region, that area should be two. And ooh, I want this to be a slider. There we go. Let's make this zero again. Let's make this five again. And so again, the green curve is an antiderivative. It's a thing whose derivative is the red curve, right? So m notice my derivative, my red curve is positive. So my green curve is increasing, 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 increasing. Uh, my derivative, my red curve is hitting zero and then it goes negative. So that green curve had a maximum and now that green curve is decreasing, right? So that green curve is my area function. All right, let's plot minus cosine of x plus 1, and it covers up the green curve because minus cosine of x plus 1 was our mystery area function. We actually solved for it. So, all right, this just shows you uh, how that all plays together again. And let's pop back over to here. So, all right, this started from an idea of just a picture. We want an area function. And we had to think about what it meant to take a derivative. And what you find is that the derivative area function is your original. All right, so let's get to a point where we don't have to go through all of this. So that point is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So FTC. And we're going to use this so much now that we are talking about it. All right, if you're given a function and it's continuous on some interval a to b and this interval could be open could be closed i don't care so i'll just do this it's not proper notation but we have a continuous function on an interval then if well i'll write this a little bit differently then the integral so the area between a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of B, I mean, talk about what that is, minus capital F of A. All right, so let's talk about capital F, where capital F of X is any function, any function, any function, satisfying F prime of X is little f, okay? So let's do a few examples. And um, also just to use some vocab, F, so big F, is called an antiderivative derivative of little f. Okay. So let's make a little table of functions and their antiderivative. So cosine, it's antiderivative of sine. And you should think about it as if I go from the right to the left, that means I take a derivative. That's how we check our work, okay? And I could add any constant that I want. So I'll just say plus c. And in fact, if I had something like x to the n, so think of the power rule. I want to do the reverse of the power rule. So instead of bringing down the power and then subtracting 1, I have to do the opposite. So I first add one and then I divide. And in fact, get plus C. And you could, again, you can check your work. Check, check your work by taking a derivative. So let's do that. If I took the derivative of x to the n plus one, plus C, and this is over n plus one, sorry. Well, what happens? I have n plus one over n plus one, so they cancel. And then I have x to the n, okay? And the derivative of c is 0, so that's gone too. Okay, so I get x to the n, which is exactly what I wanted. All right, what else, what else, what else? Let's see, if I have like 1 over x, its derivative is natural log x plus c. Uh, if I have sine, oh, sorry. I, I, I just said the derivative of 1 over x is natural log x. The antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log x plus c. 
The antiderivative of sine, as we just saw, is negative cosine of x plus c. Okay, this is enough to do some examples. So let's look at the area from 0 to e of sine of x plus 1 over x plus x squared dx. All right, so what does this mean? This means I need a function. So here's my little f. I need a big F satisfying, so such that the derivative of big F is my little f. But this is not so bad because you can actually just take it piece by piece, piece by piece, piece by piece. So let's see, a function whose derivative is sine would be negative cosine. So I start with negative cosine of x. And now, since I've included this, I've taken care of the sine part. Plus. And now I need a function whose derivative is 1 over x, and that's natural log of x. And so I've taken care of that part. Plus. And now I need a function whose derivative of x squared, so I come up here. Okay, so if n was 2, then this would be x cubed over 3. All right, so how about x cubed over 3? And I could add any constant I want, but that truly will not matter. Oh, 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 a little bit of an issue. Uh, let's change the 0 to a 1. Okay, uh, the issue is um, 1 over x is not continuous at 0. And up here, for the fundamental theorem of calculus, I need f of x to be continuous on my a to b. And if 1 over x is used and I have a 0, there's an issue because it blows up at 0, right? So I just had to tweak that a little bit, sorry. All right, but now we're good. Now we're good. So what goes here is big F at E minus big F at 1, right? Okay, well, what is big F at E? It's negative cosine E plus the natural log at e plus e cubed over 3, and I could have plus c if I want. And uh, let's see, minus, and I'll just drop it down for room. I have minus cosine of 1 plus ln of 1 plus 1 cubed over 3 plus c. And notice how the c's don't matter because I have plus c and minus C. So they're going to go away. So they never actually matter. What matters is the stuff involving X. And so here it is. Here's my answer. I can clean it up a little bit, but for the sake of showing you how to use a fundamental theorem of calculus, this is good enough. And I think it's good enough for you all to try.